died. <laughs> I just, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Uh, so, uh, continuing on, I think today, <clears throat> and uh, I, I am starting a little early because I'm going to have to quit a little early, um, but... <clears throat> <clears throat> We've been looking at, <clears throat> now we're into the prophetic scriptures with respect to God's covenant promise to bring the Jewish people back. <clears throat> and uh, today I want to look at Ezekiel 36. And as I've often uh, spoken on this section and uh, many times I've prefaced it by saying... If you want to understand what God is doing right now, <clears throat> perhaps the clearest explanation is Ezekiel chapter 36. And we're going to notice there's a little shift in uh, the order of things <clears throat> as it's stipulated in the Torah, but I think <clears throat> I've it won't be so difficult for us because we've hopefully built enough of a foundation to understand why this is the way it is. <clears throat> okay, Ezekiel 36. Um, starting in verse 16. Ezekiel 30, chap chapter 36. Thirty-six, sixteen. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel was living in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their way before me was like the uncleanness of a woman in her impurity. Therefore I poured up my wrath on them for the blood that they'd shed on the land, because they defiled it with their idols. So this is exactly the covenant expectation that if you disobey the Lord, you will come under judgment and that sin defiles the land, which is, uh, you know, we could talk a lot about that, but we, we don't have time. Therefore, I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed throughout the lands. According to their ways and their deeds, I judged them. So that is what God said would happen. If you continue to disobey, you will go into exile. But when they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name, because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they've come out of his land. So this is very important to understand that Israel's choosing as a holy nation and a kingdom of priests meant that they were functioning as priests to represent God to the nations. That's what a priest does. God rep a priest represents God to the people and the people to God. So this is one half of priestly function representing God to the people. In this case, if they are the priests for all nations, to represent God to the nations. And uh, they, uh, instead of helping the nations uh, see who the maker of heaven and earth truly is, they'd actually... Uh, created a problem for God because now the people in the nations are saying this is the people of the Lord yet they've come out of his land and God says this is a you by doing so you've profaned my holy name well, what does this mean well think about it you are a Babylonian and there are the captives you know marching through the gate and, uh, you know, two Babylonian guys, Marty and Chris, <clears throat> by the side of the road. And uh, Chris says to Marty, hey, what's going on here? And I say, oh, yeah, 
These, uh, these are the people of the Lord, but they're our slaves now. Pretty good, huh? Chris says, do right, mate. <laughs> Very common Babylonian saying. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's like, wow, so maybe this God of theirs isn't quite who they say he is. I mean, after all, if he really is the maker of heaven and earth, how could they be our slaves? It seems to me our gods are more powerful than their god. Otherwise, we'd be their slaves, not the other way around. So you see, it wasn't... God promised this is the outcome for disobedience, but in this process of punishing Israel for sin, as he said he would do, it created a problem for God because when Israel does not represent God properly, it profanes his holy name. And the nations would get the wrong impression of who God is. Now, I think as you know, disciples of Yeshua, this is a really important principle for us because how many times has, uh, you know, in the name of Jesus, we have profaned his holy name by not obeying his word, by not representing him properly. So it's, it's a very important thing. Hmm. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations wherever they went. By the way, in the curses in Deuteronomy 28, it says you will become a, a byword and a proverb among the nations, just like he's describing here. People will look at you and they'll say, ah, those are the children of the, the people of the Lord and they've come out of his land. You will become a proverb. And I guess this is uh, central to our understanding of what God is doing now. This is ultimately not about Israel. It's ultimately not about the nations. Ultimately, everything God is doing is for the sake of his holy name. Now, that might seem, I don't know. Does God, is God insecure? No, obviously not. Uh, but uh, really, I suppose, for, I think, for our sakes, uh, he will vindicate his name, first of all, because that's who he is, but also so that we can see. And as Paul, at the end of Romans 11, when he's describing how God is going to eventually turn this whole thing around and bring salvation to Israel, he concludes by saying, for of him and to him and through him are all things. Ultimately, it is of him, through him, to him, for the sake of his holy name. Praise the Lord. So when you look at it that way, and I think we've been talking about this a lot, but when you look at it that way, we understand that no matter what anyone says or does, God will accomplish all that he is determined to do because it is of him, through him, and to him. It is for the sake of his holy name. Praise the Lord, somebody say. Amen. 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 So in verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. So God is saying, I'm about to do something here, and don't get the wrong impression. This is not for you, this is for me. But we'll see it's not just for him. And perhaps this is the counterbalance to Romans 11.11, 11, where it says, God brought salvation to the Gentiles in order to provoke Israel to jealousy, you know? So in a, in a, in a sense, Romans 11.11 11 is saying, Oh, you 
people in the nations, I'm not acting on, uh, for your sake, but for the sake of my holy name and for my people Israel. And you might be going, hmm, really? I've been saved to make Israel jealous? Well, of course, it's not the only reason you've been saved, but in a sense, you've been saved on behalf of another people. That's very really hard for us to, uh, to grasp because we've never... We don't hear that very often, but that's what it says in black and white Romans 11. 11, okay. Uh, let's keep moving. <laughs> All right. But for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which you have profaned among the nations, when you have profaned, which you have profaned in their midst. And then I'm just going to skip down to verse 24 here. Before we do, God says, I'm going to do something. Not for your sake, O house of Israel, but for the sake of my holy name. I'm going to vindicate my name. So, the problem is Israel is in rebellion and therefore in, goes into exile and therefore profanes God's name by... Uh, causing God's reputation to be questioned in the nations. These are the people of the Lord, and he couldn't even look after them. What kind of God is that? So, this is an issue of sin, iniquity, and rebellion. And how does God resolve this problem? And this is very important for all of us. What does God do with the problem of sin, iniquity, and rebellion? Anybody? What does God do? How does God resolve this? Well, let me ask you a question, okay? Can I, can I pick on somebody? I'll ask Diane. Diane? No. What's that? <laughs> what did God do for you with regards to your sin, iniquity, and rebellion? Well, he sent Jesus to die for me, first of all. Uh huh. And so when I received that revelation and asked him to save me, I knew that, but I still had to repent. Yeah. He convicted me. But then what did he do? He forgave you, yes? Yes, yes definitely. <laughs> Aren't you glad? Yes, absolutely. He had absolutely. mercy on you. Yes. Didn't he have mercy on you? Absolutely. God, you know, just does not wink at sin. But ultimately, his solution for sin is mercy. All of us can say, that's true in our life. When we were yet sinners. Amen? Christ died for us. When we were his enemies, he sent his son. Enemies. Not just sinners who ignored him, but enemies. We were contrary in everything we did and thought. He sent his son for us. Yes, we had to receive him, but he's the one who initiates. Amen? He's the one who shows mercy. And uh, we're talking about the same God here. This is how he deals with Israel. So this is what he says in verse 24. For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Because you have caused a problem for me by your sin... This is how I'm going to resolve this problem. I'm going to gather you where I've scattered you and bring you back into your own land. And I'm going to go back to verse 23. It says, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which you've profaned among the nations, and which you've profaned in their midst, and then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. Isn't this amazing? So if you're feeling a little bit like, 
What, I've just been saved to provoke Israel to jealousy? You should know that God is restoring Israel so that the nations will know that he is the Lord. He is dealing with, yay, Rel is feeling so much better now. Yes. <laughs> you see, he balances out the equation very beautifully. You've been saved to provoke us to jealousy. We are being restored so that you will know that he is the Lord. And all of it is for the sake of his holy name. And here's another amazing thing included in verse 24. When I am made holy among you. Now what is another way of saying be made holy? Sanctified or hallowed? hallowed. Right? Hallowed. What are we talking about here in Ezekiel 36? God's great name being hallowed. Hello. If you know one scripture, you know this one. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is the pattern Yeshua gave for us to pray when we pray. The first thing we are to say. Your name, hallowed. God says, the nations will know I am the Lord when they see me hallowed among you. When I bring you back from where I've scattered you. Are you getting this? When you, this might sound a little radical, but when you pray, hallowed be thy name, you have to hear the echo of Ezekiel 36. And my name will be hallowed among you when I bring you back in the sight of the nations. Did you know the Lord's Prayer is an Aliyah prayer? Yeah, am I being crazy? But it is. But we don't typically say it that way. I think there's, it's not just that. I'm not trying to say it's just about Aliyah, but certainly it's not a coincidence in my opinion that you have this, these, this same uh, principle in Matthew 6 and Ezekiel 36. Now, <clears throat> is Israel repenting here? No, right? Remember what we read both in Deuteronomy 30, Leviticus 26, when you take it to heart and you confess your sin, then I will gather you and bring you back. As it is cast in the Torah, it is first Israel moves and then God moves. But I hope you understand now that Israel never moves without God first moving first. It's always the same. With us too, he loves, we love him because he first loved us. It's always God who takes the initiative, even to bring us to repentance. Amen? Friday, I'll talk about Zechariah, but it says, I'll pour out a spirit of grace and supplication. What is that? It, that is supplication, repentance. I'm going to pour out a spirit of repentance on the house of Israel. It's always God who moves first. And he's clarifying that here in Ezekiel 36. God is the one who moves first. I will bring you back from everywhere I scattered you. Verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols Moreover, I will give you a new heart. Hello? Right? Look at Deuteronomy 30. First, I'll gather you from everywhere you've been scattered, and then the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. He is 
expressing the same concepts that are laid out in the covenant. Moreover, I'll put a new spirit within you and remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes, and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. That's kind of like what it says in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. So that you will love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul, and you will live. How do we live? We live... By the Spirit, by walking in the Spirit, by walking according to the Spirit, by walking according to the Word of God. It's it's here too, but I want to emphasize the two stages that are delineated here in Ezekiel 36, perhaps clearer than anywhere else, because... You don't quite see stage one, stage two in Deuteronomy 30, but here it's very clear. First, I take you from wherever you were, I bring you back. And then I pour the clean water on you. And then I fill you with the Spirit. And then I give you a new heart. And then I... (coughs) Pull that stony heart out of you, that heart of rebellion, and I give you a heart of flesh, (laughs) a soft heart, so that you will love me with all your heart and all your soul and you will live. So, there's a principle in farming, Less, right? If you get the first fruits, you get the... Harvest at the end. Is that right, Les? If you get A, it's the assurance you get B. We've got A. I will bring you back from everywhere that I have scattered you. A has been going on now for what? Uh, 140-ish years. If you've got A, you're going to get B. B is, and then I will pour clean water on you and cleanse you from your sin. My brothers and sisters, we've been 140 years of A. We've only had... I don't know where you start, but nowhere near that long of B. It's just starting. B is just underway. You're in the alley of return center. (laughs) This is, in my opinion, sort of a demonstration of B is underway. We have A, we know we're going to get B. And now, Alia becomes something more than just bringing Jewish people home to their homeland, though that is wonderful and good. There is an expectation of this process continuing. And uh, if you recall, Yeshua's mandate is to gather Israel back to him. It's a spiritual process. It's what Dean Bai likes to say, the, you know, the greatest heart surgery operation ever undertaken. And uh, it's just underway. And the outcome is God's holy name is vindicated and the nations will know that he is the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's good, isn't it? Amen. So, really uh, spend some time in Ezekiel 36. Really get, get it 
in you. And this is, I think, perhaps, you know, a, a, a starting place where you can share about what God is doing in Israel today. Because uh, we are seeing this word being fulfilled before our eyes. Praise the Lord. All right. Anybody have a... So I'm expecting Garrett to come through those doors any second, but anybody have something they want to say? Yeah, really, go ahead. Yep. Amen. That's right. And always, you know, whenever God talks about the physical restoration, you see uh, next door in, you know, very close by in proximity, this talk about a new heart, just like we were reading the other day in Jeremiah 31. Yeah. And then it continues on in Ezekiel 37. Uh, and it gives another picture of this from a different... Have a good day. Blessings. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? I'm just thinking of like, like the Great Commission. So, again, coming here from an evangelical background, you know, we're told to go out and, you know... Amen. So tying that in with what you're saying today, obviously we want to make Gentiles become believers so that they can help in this process. Of, right? Like to bring the Jews home. Like well, I would look at it this way. There's two great arcs of movement. And perhaps the Great Commission is, if we can talk in this way, the greater arc. There is the gospel going from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, right? Take this gospel to the ends of the earth. Make disciples of all nations. From Jerusalem out. At the same time, I will bring you back from the furthest corners of the earth back to Jerusalem. So God's doing both things at the same time. And as believers, this is uh, what I would say. If God is involved in both, we are involved in both. It's not one or the other. It's not one for the sake of the other. They both are converging to the return of the Lord. So... um, we see what God is doing. He's bringing the people back. And uh, His mandate is our mandate. And we, 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 we have the commission for bringing the people back in Isaiah 49. Uh, but of course, this is not to in any way diminish the the, the importance of the mandate to continue to take this gospel to the ends of the earth. It's just like in Matthew 24, Yeshua says, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness against all nations and then the end will come. But just before that, Matthew 23, verse 39 says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which stones the prophets, how, you know, uh, I tell you, you will not see me again. That is another way of saying the end will not come until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So there we see these two movements, one going out, one coming back also. Um, And if you look at Yeshua's mandate in Isaiah 49, 5 and 6, it says the same thing. You know, for this reason... The servant was born to restore the tribes of Jacob and to be God's salvation to the ends of the earth. Um, Yeah, that's how I, I see it.
Yeah, Steve. Two thoughts on kind of a question as well. Um, so we're talking about sanctifying his name. It reminds me of the Iranic benediction, where it says the purpose of it is not just a blessing over the people. It's, the Lord says that you, the, the priest will speak this over the people so that my name will be on mm -hmm. So it's not just it's not just Israel carrying the, the, the word, the Torah. Um, it's not just them carrying the witness of, like, these are God's people. Like, his name is, like, on them. <laughs> like, so the, as they're carrying the, his name to the nations and they're not walking in his ways, it's, like, it's such more of, like, an intimate defilement in a sense. Yeah, that's a good and point. Thank true. you. Yeah, yeah. And the second thought... But, but also, doesn't that apply to all of us, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeshua lives in us. Yeah, yeah. We are the temple mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.